I'm Gare, by the way. I'm one of the pastors here. Good to see you. We are going to read straight from God's Word and dive in today. So if you're new to Vintage, welcome. We really want to honor um, how God speaks to us through the Bible. We're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. You ready? All right. You clap now. Um, All right, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. So just a little context here, Paul is in prison. He's one of the early church leaders, and he's facing his execution for following Jesus. And he's writing his last letter to a friend called Timothy, who is pastoring and leading a church in a city called Ephesus. And he's giving him this charge. Maybe this is his last words to his friend. He's going, look, I'm giving you this instruction. And here it is. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. With great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Let's pray together before we sit. Father, we thank you that you speak to us. And whether we're far from you, not too sure about you, you speak to us. And whether we've been following you for many years, you love to speak to us. So we all here this morning humbly ask that by your Holy Spirit, you speak to each one of us. You love to lead us, to guide us, to woo us into your love and your affections, to empower us, and sometimes to correct and rebuke us because we do things which are not good for us or for others, and we need to hear that too. So as we sit in this Bible passage, we pray that it's not just a book study, but you, by your Holy Spirit, meet with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Grab a seat. I want to concentrate this morning on one of the ways that Paul says to Timothy, outwork your calling, outwork what God has got you to do. Every one of us was created with purpose. Every one of us is a unique design by God with his affection and meaning in our lives. We have significance, we have meaning, we have purpose. And Timothy's reading this letter from Paul with this instruction, this charge, this challenge to outwork your calling. Don't neglect who God made you to be. And one of the words he uses for Timothy is an unusual word and sometimes a scary word. And it's, he says this, do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. That word in Greek is simply someone who announces the good news of Jesus to others. Someone who tells others about Jesus. Timothy was a full-time pastor of a church and part of his gifting, it seemed, was he had a way of communicating the good news of Jesus to people who were far from Jesus and maybe were not followers of Jesus. Have you ever been around someone who's really gifted at telling other people about Jesus? That may not be you. You may be thinking, I'm terrible at that. But I remember one person who was. I remember... uh, A friend in my life, he was actually my boss for a season called Michael Green. And I remember it was really annoying having coffee with Michael because when you ever went to a coffee shop, he'd spend more time talking to the waiter or someone about Jesus than actually talking to me. He'd be like, dude, I came here for coffee and you've just spent half an hour talking to the waiter about Jesus. I remember going into the bank one day with him because he had to drop some money off. And I waited outside actually and he was in there for 30 minutes 
I said, what happened? He went, oh, I was just talking to someone about Jesus. I go, you're so annoying. <laughs> but it's good, I know. But there, there are some people who are just gifted. Now, people go, well, did it work? I remember actually Michael died and went to be with Jesus not so long ago. And at his funeral, there were many people who were on the other side of those 30-minute conversations who said, actually, it was that conversation that actually triggered my exploring of Jesus. And I'm now following him, thanks to Michael taking 30 minutes and ignoring Gare. <laughs> but that's not me. I actually struggle with those kind of interactions sometimes. But though we might not all be professional evangelists, we are all called to tell others the good news about Jesus. Because good news is impossible to contain. I mean, many people, I remember growing up in the north of England where I didn't know any Christians at all, and except some in church, but all my friends at school were either atheists, agnostic, Muslim, or Sikh. Very multicultural environment, and... I remember trying to tell someone about Jesus one day and someone said, oh, it'd be much better, Gay. You'd be such a better Christian if you just kept it to yourself. <laughs> They're the best types of Christians, those who don't actually tell others. But of course, it's impossible not to tell others good news. It's unloving not to tell your best friends some amazing piece of news that you've discovered. I remember when my wife gave birth to our second daughter, Naomi, who's down here right now. And I remember it was my job. I had a very little job to do. Lizzie had the main job. I had a very tiny job, which was when Naomi arrived, was to get on the phone and tell our friends and family that Naomi had arrived. And I remember starting at the top of the list and Naomi had arrived. And by the time I got to the third or fourth down the list, I would say, hey, guess what? And they would say, we've heard. <laughs> we've heard, congratulations. I go, how did you hear? I said, oh, your mum told me, or your sister told me. It's like, oh my word, good news cannot be contained. And when it comes to telling people about Jesus, the heart of it is good news just can't be contained. Paul reminds Timothy of the good news that can never be contained in chapter two. We looked at it a couple of weeks ago. I want to read it again. It's on the screen here. He says, look, he says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. Hang on. I got the wrong passage. It's chapter one. I gave him the wrong passage. Sorry about this. So I'll read it out and take that off the screen. But this is the good news that Jesus actually, that we can't help but tell people about. He says this, Jesus has saved us and called us to a different life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death. That's good news. And brought life, better news. And immortality, life eternal, through the good news. And of this gospel, he says, I'm appointed a herald, an apostle and a teacher. This is why I'm suffering as I am. This is such good news for Paul that it meant actually it's worth me dying if other people get to hear this good news. We can't contain the good news of Jesus. If we love our friends, if we love our neighbors, if we love our city, who are lost and broken and struggling, they may look amazing on the outside, but it's brokenness within. How could we not keep Jesus from them? At times I thought, hang on a minute, but it'd be great to tell people about Jesus, but isn't it kind of, in our city of LA, isn't it intolerant to tell people about Jesus? Isn't it kind of, I don't want to come across as critical or I want to love people the way they are. I want to honor the way they are. Um, I don't want to come across as critical. And in fact, this is actually quite confusing for today's Christians because we do want to love people 
where they're at. We don't want to criticize people. And so there's a general confusion as to what does it mean to tell someone about Jesus and not be judgy or critical about where they are at. So much so that there's a statistic that's come out a few years ago, which I think rings true, which is it's on the screen here. It says 47% of Christian millennials believe it's wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith, hoping that they will one day share your faith. And I think people are struggling with the difference between judging and criticizing and the difference with just simply telling someone your own experience, hoping they may experience it too. See, tolerance is not actually holding something to yourself. Tolerance is this beautiful gift in our society, which we're so thankful for, that no one is coerced into thinking anything. They can actually believe something for themselves. But that doesn't mean we can't recommend things to one another. We, it doesn't mean we can't say, have you tried this burger down the road? It's the best ever. That's not intolerant. That's going, I know you like your burger at in and out but have you tried this? I know you like your coffee, but have you tried this? We all love to recommend our favorite things to one another. And actually, it's a great gift of love. I don't want you to miss out on this. It's the same thing with our relationship with Jesus. I can't keep it to myself. Not because I'm criticizing others, but I want others to have the opportunity to explore Jesus for themselves. But yeah, that's all good. You know, it, good news can't be contained and okay, it's not intolerant, it's just saying to people what you found, which is great, and they can make up their own mind, which is great. But how on earth do you do that in today's culture where it's kind of awkward to talk about Jesus? You know, it's, kind of, it's kind of off-putting. And of course, that is true. We're living in a cultural moment that's very different to maybe how our parents or previous generations found it a lot easier to tell people about Jesus. My father was a church pastor, and I remember him telling me one day, I said, what did you do like, to tell people about Jesus? He said, oh, it was very simple, back in the 60s. It was very simple. What I'd do is I'd go to a village somewhere in the south of England, and I'd put a little poster up in, on, the community, on the community notice board, which said, come here about Jesus, Sunday, 5 p.m. And I hired a venue. And he went, it's amazing, the whole village would come. And I'd talk to them about Jesus, and lots of them would follow Jesus. I'd go, hang on a minute, hang on, time out. People came. Like, people didn't go, no thanks. Like, people listened to you. Like, people didn't object. People didn't say, whoa, hang on a minute. So, no, it was a lot easier back then. I went, it sure is a lot easier back then. We all know, don't we, that times have shifted a bit. And in our city like LA, even to mention the word Jesus can actually bring some pretty... A tricky, tricky conversation. And actually, we have to recognize that things have shifted in how we then go about telling people about Jesus. Um, if you've been at Vintage for more than three minutes, you may have seen these slides before, but um, let me put one up, which is, see, in the 1950s, if someone had spiritual hunger, then they would automatically consider Jesus. They'd go, huh, let me just think about Jesus. Because there'd already be a cultural deposit of who Jesus is, what the good news of Jesus is in their life, and they respected maybe Christianity, they respected the church, maybe had some Christians who thought, wow, they're lovely people, and maybe really to become a follower of Jesus was just, it needed a kind of a pivotal moment to wake someone up, to like, where are you going to go when you die? And there was amazing people like Billy Graham and others who would give people that moment, that convictional moment. But of course, time moved on and not everybody had such a positive background to Christianity or a, a, a rich deposit of what it meant to be a Christian. And by the 70s and 80s, there were now some things in the way of exploring Jesus. There's some obstacles in the way. Church was still popular in many ways. Jesus was still a, a figure with respect. But now there were some, kind of some impediments in the way. The rise of multiculturalism, the rise of globalism, the rise of entertainment culture in the 80s in particular, meant that actually people were kind of questioning, well, hang on a minute, why is Jesus the only way? 
Or church seems a bit boring. Um, is it life? What about these experiences? I'm traveling a lot more now. My neighbor is of a different faith. Why is he wrong and I'm right? And people had all sorts of questions. They were not assuming what they used to assume. And so things shifted in how we told people about Jesus. There were more evidence-based books that were written, which was super helpful, like Case for Christ or Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Still really helpful. And church became more kind of low, like low-key, more kind of guitars and drums to be a bit, hey, we're more relevant, you know, Jesus' life. And, and that was super helpful. But today, things have changed a lot more. And if I would summarize where we are today, <laughs> is if someone meets a Christian who hears about Jesus, they run the other way. Right? Spiritual hunger means the last place I look is Jesus. I actually want to look at other things. And that could be for lots of different reasons. Maybe I'm just unaware. I, I've, gosh, I haven't really ever been to church. Or maybe my experience of Christianity or church is toxic. The last place I go, maybe I rejected it. Maybe I came from Alabama, so I came to LA to leave that behind. It's also deeply unpopular. It's like, why would I ever follow Jesus? Because that's like meaning I'm going to be unpopular among my friend group. And also there's this thing of self-discovery, of experience, that people are fatigued of maybe the evidence-based approach to discovering Jesus, and they go, oh my, I'm just, I don't know what's true. I, don't, I just don't know. You know what? I'm just going to do what's true for me. I don't really care if it's true, true. I just want what's true for me. I just need help. You know what? And I find help doing this or that. And that, that's what works. And I, it may not be true, true, but is there any true, true out there? And so the last place people do look is maybe Jesus. And we all know that deep down, don't we? We feel that in the culture of our city. And so I, I asked this question myself on this next slide. Is there a way to tell others about Jesus that isn't pushy, super awkward, preachy, disrespectful, judgy, arrogant, unloving, unkind, cheesy, shaming, super difficult, and social suicide? <laughs> so I, we want others to at least consider Jesus. We want people to explore him. We're not trying to push it, but how do we do that in a culture that feels that way whenever you talk about Jesus? Paul actually helps us here in writing this letter because when he says to Timothy in chapter four, look, you need to tell others about Jesus because you're really good at it. He also says in chapter two, this is how you do it. And I think we can look at this helpfully for our own context. He says on the screen here in 2 Timothy chapter two, he says, look, a servant of the Lord as you outwork what God's given you to do, don't quarrel. Like, don't get into arguments. Don't get on Twitter and just blast people. Is that still a thing? I'm showing how old I am, Twitter. Anyway, but you must be kind to everyone. Be able to teach. Be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. I mean, just go back one slide and look at the words that Paul uses, and this is how we can tell others about Jesus. It's not pushy, critical, arrogant. He starts with, be kind. Be kind. I find kindness begins with listening rather than telling. Like, where are you at in your faith journey? Actually, I really want to hear. I want to know what you think. We're so quick, aren't we, to tell. Sometimes, actually, I think all the time, we need to listen and see what's going on in their lives. He says, then be able to teach, which means, look, people have really important questions about faith. They've got very good questions about faith, which I remember I valued as, as a lawyer for many years, I believe in evidence, I believe in reasoned thinking, and faith to me is not about myth or legend, it's about fact and history, and, and yet so often in church, I would never get answers to those questions, and it took a while for someone to go, there are good questions, and there are great answers, let me help you with them. 
We need to be able to help people with reasonable, intelligent, believable, compelling answers to things like, what about science and faith? What about suffering? What about this whole thing, Jesus is the son of God, but he's also God? What's that about, right? We actually need to help people be able to give answers. Then it says, and be patient with people who are being difficult. What I find is patience is so needed because people have been so hurt and wounded that actually, to begin with, they may have a visceral reaction to what you're saying. We have to be patient, recognizing that actually maybe they've been on the wrong side of church hurt. That was my story. You know my story, many of you. I left the church in my mid-20s because I was so hurt by the church. I want to say right now, I had also done some horrible things. It was just this really brutal situation. I felt so hurt by the church that I left. And when a friend invited me back a couple of years later, I had a panic attack as soon as I walked through the front door and had to leave and go out to the parking lot. I couldn't come in the building. It took me a while to be able to kind of enter in a few, you know, a few attempts later. I remember I could only make it to the back row of the balcony. I love you guys. <laughs> I'm not saying anything about you guys. But I was sweating on the back row. And as slowly, people were patient with me and loved me and listened to me and helped me with my questions. But you know what? They were patient. There is no microwaving people exploring Jesus. And then he says, with gentleness. Most people, having talked to people about Jesus and listened to people for so many years, I've come to the conclusion that almost every person who has their own faith view has come to that faith for you through pain. It wasn't an intellectual exercise. It was through pain. And being gentle then of realizing, oh my gosh, there's a reason this person can't step foot in church. I'm so sorry. A friend of mine a few years ago said, there's a a reason he couldn't come to church because his father was abused by a priest. It took him a long time to tell me that and now it was like, oh, I'm so, it, I'm so sorry. And he felt loved by Christians. He said, I've never felt Christians like this before who were gentle, understanding. Maybe Jesus is like that, not like that priest. And then finally, it says here, perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. So important when we're telling others about Jesus to realize that ultimately we are not in control of anyone. Only God can meet people. All we can do is kind of facilitate the conversation. All we can do is go as, it says of one of the disciples called Philip, he said to his friend Nathaniel, mate, you should check out this guy called Jesus. And then the rest was up to Jesus and Nathaniel. We are simply facil facilitating an encounter between someone exploring Jesus and we leave the results to Jesus. It means we don't get pushy and forceful. It it, we're relaxed and enjoy someone exploring Jesus and we see what happens. See, these are the values of what it means to tell someone about Jesus. But I don't know about you, but I'm going, that's all great, Gare, um, but I don't know how to do it. I'm still a bit nervous about how to do it. I still am awkward. I don't know all the answers. I don't know how to teach someone about the difference between Jesus as God and the Son of God. I don't understand Genesis and science. I don't understand suffering and God loving us. I don't understand, how could I teach... We feel kind of paralyzed because we can't do all this stuff. I want to tell you about a friend of mine who I've never met, but I love his books, <laughs> called Alistair Humphreys. Anybody ever heard of Alistair Humphreys? This is Alistair. Alistair won and was awarded the National Geographic Adventurer of the Year. 
It wasn't because at nine he completed a 20 mile Yorkshire three peak challenge. It wasn't because at 13 he completed the British three peaks challenge in 24 hours. It wasn't because at 15 he cycled off road across England. It wasn't because a few years later he ran the London Marathon dressed as a rhinoceros. It wasn't because in college every summer he was to cycle across a new continent. It wasn't for any of these things. He was awarded National Geographic Adventure of the Year because what he did when he wasn't doing these macro adventures. You see, when he got to his late 20s, he fell in love, got married, uh, had children, and realized, oh, I just don't have the bandwidth anymore to go trekking across South America. And he embraced that. It wasn't negative. It was like, this is my life. I'm so excited. I'm in a regular job. But he yearned for adventure still. He thought, do I have to give it up? but I just can't do it. I don't have the time, don't have the capacity, don't have the resources to do these big macro adventures. Instead, he became National Geographic Adventure of the Year because he encouraged the world who were like him in busy, in lives where you're constantly having to do things, soccer practice, work, visit parents. He introduced a new concept called micro-adventures. He became National Geographic Adventure of the Year because he introduced to the whole world that though you may not be able to do macro adventures, doesn't stop you doing micro adventures. And in his books, he talks about, therefore, using all of life as an opportunity for micro adventures. One of my favorite stories was he was um, going to a business conference in Holland and he was in the taxi cab on the way from the airport to the conference center and all the canals there going across bridges and we past one bridge, and he saw um, all these like, high schoolers jumping in into the river and having the best time ever. So he went, I want to do that. So he said to the taxi guy, stop, I'm going to go for a swim. Time for a micro adventure. He then said to the taxi guy, do you want to join me? He goes, sure. <laughs> and so they both just jumped in with their clothes on, had a laugh for about 20 minutes, got back in the cab and went to the conference and spoke at the conference dripping wet. <laughs> the taxi guy stayed in touch and said, that was the most exciting 20 minutes of my life. <laughs> I'm introducing micro adventures into my life right now and much to the chagrin of my family. Um, and so my son and I the other day, was, instead of just having lunch, we, we pretended that we were in the back country in our garden and set up our little chairs, our camp chairs, our little stove, our dehydrated meals, and we had the best time ever. Last night, my daughter and I, um, I said, look, let's do a micro adventure. So we went out and we got some food and I took a picnic basket, picnic blanket, got my little uh, mosquito spray, little canister on the gas stove thing, got a little lantern. I said, look, we're gonna find, we're gonna go up to the hills and we're gonna find like a beautiful view of Los Angeles and just set up camp and have dinner out over the view. So I thought, praying, oh, help me find this, Lord. <laughs> I have no idea where we're going. Naomi being ever trusting, but in a doubt, I think we're there, going, where are we gonna find this? So we drove up and actually for about 20 minutes, I couldn't find anything because apparently in California, and Los Angeles, you build houses on all the views. And <laughs> if you don't have a house, you don't get the view. And so we're driving around and I, took, I thought, you know what? If we can't find it anywhere, we'll go back to our kind of house. We'll do it in the backyard, less exciting. But micro boring that would have been. But anyway, <laughs> and then all of a sudden I said, look, we're gonna, one last try. Went up this road called Kenta in Brentwood. Drove up, drove up, drove up, and all of a sudden we turned the corner, there it is. Some unbuilt plot of land between two mansions <laughs> with a little bench overlooking, not the city, but the next canyon with homes, and it was pitch black and all the little lights, and we thought, great, let's set up. So we set it all up, I put my mosquito thing on, we put out the blanket, we um, got out our little kit and made our food, and um, we had a drink, and we're sitting there, and then to queue, which was absolutely amazing, just at that moment, some wealthy home across the valley were deciding to having a live band and it started straight away. <laughs> Way too loud for the neighbors, but perfect for us. <laughs> and we just listened to this amazing, it was less amazing uh, singer, but it was really good. It was, <laughs> but we had this beautiful kind of concert 
just for us two, having a micro-adventure in the hills above Brentwood. Now, why am I saying this? Most of us feel, I can't do macro-evangelism. I'm not Billy Graham. I don't have all the answers. I don't know what to say when people do this. But you can do micro-evangelism. You can take small steps to help others discover Jesus. And I'm going to give you four micro-evangelism things that we can all do. Wherever you are, no matter how nervous you feel, no matter what your HR department says, (laughs) you can do these four things. The first is this, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus in such a way that you become a compelling curiosity. People in our city are longing for a better way of life. They're longing to see people live in such a way that they are peaceful, that they are in rich community, that they are loving the injustice loving the poor and the the lost of our city. They are serving in a way that isn't just about me, myself, and I. People go, it's a compelling curiosity when people in our city rub up against true followers of Jesus. So number one, just follow Jesus that other people can see the difference he makes in your life. I think there's a great opportunity in the election cycle coming up for you to be a compelling curiosity, not an off-putting curiosity. Oh my gosh, if you're a follower of Jesus, here's the challenge, be the first Christian someone likes. (laughs) Shouldn't be a hard job, because it says even the worst of the worst people loved Jesus. Follow Jesus so that you're a compelling curiosity. Secondly, be authentic. Just be authentic. Let your faith be authentic in conversation. Not manipulated and unauthentic, but be authentic. I remember when I was in a normal job for 10 years before I became a pastor, I just thought, you know, I'll just be authentic about my faith. I'm not going to try and create unauthentic, contrived moments, but I'm just going to be authentic in short ways that people go, oh, that's a bit odd. So for example, Monday morning at work, hey Gare, how was was your weekend? It was pretty cool actually. Friday night, went to the pub, had a great time. Saturday, played golf. Saturday night, went to a restaurant, went a bit of clubbing afterwards. uh, Sunday morning, church was off the hook, I'll tell you that. And then I had a great lunch afterwards and then rested. How about you? It's like, whoa, 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 time out. Church was off the hook. I go, yeah. Normally it's gay, but we had this guy called John Mark preach, and it was amazing. <laughs> right? Right? It's just be authentic. Don't hide what Jesus does in your life. Don't, don't contrive it. Just be authentic. You know, I've met a friend of mine, I remember when a friend of mine was healed significantly of this long illness that he'd had. I remember going to work the next day and just going, hey, yeah, what's up? I go, I tell you, man, I know you don't believe in the big G and all that kind of stuff, but I tell you, I'm just like on cloud nine because my friend was like healed. Uh, Legit, non-American weird kind of healing things that are all frauds. This was was real. He goes, really? Yeah. Just be authentic. Let people see that actually Jesus is real in your life. Not because you're then trying to contrive a moment, right? Everyone smells that a mile away. And they actually don't want to be pushed, but just be authentic in who you are. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I'm actually having a bad mental health day, but I, I prayed this morning and I feel, I feel God is with me. How are you? Just be normal. Just be authentic. Thirdly, pray. Pray for your friends. Pray for them. God loves them so much. The best definition of sharing your faith faith with others is from a friend of mine who was my preaching professor. Um, 
You're all probably thinking, you had a preaching professor? (laughs) But he said this, evangelism is joining a conversation the Holy Spirit is already having with another person. Just pray for people and say, Lord, how can I help the conversation you're already having? I don't have to contrive something. I don't have to throw a Bible at someone. I don't have to bury a little testimony tract under, under their work desk or something. No, I just need to listen and pray, Lord, give me an opportunity to join you in what you're doing with that person. See, I've known so many people have come to Jesus and they all say to me, actually, it's been this really interesting thing. I feel like God's been showing up all over the place. It's not you, it's God. There's fingerprints of God all over people's lives and they start to become aware of it. And all you need to do is be around and love them and pray for them so God can use you as he's already talking to them. I remember when I was at university, I prayed, okay, I'll pray for 30 days that God would give me every day an an authentic, non-contrived opportunity to, to just talk about Jesus. And guess what happened every day? There was one. Because God is longing to use you just to love other people. And then fourthly, and this is important because on this slide we recognize that, oh my gosh, go to the next slide. There. On this slide we recognize, but how do I help people go across all of that stuff? I mean, I can't answer their questions and they need some good answers. Man, they need a lot of patience. I see my boss every six weeks. You know, how do I be in relationship to help them with these things? And this is my life for a long time. God, how do I act? I can't do this on my own. And that's why I think the fourth step of microevangelism is simply this, inviting someone to church or the Alpha launch night. Just bring them, bring them. Kind of let others pick up the good work that you've begun in just loving people well. That's why we run Alpha, actually. Because I needed a space, which wasn't Sundays because I was so freaked out about Christians and church, that I needed a safe space to explore on my own terms without any judgment, without any pressure, without any preaching. I just needed a safe space to go, I just, I've got some, I've got some issues. I want to explore this guy called Jesus, but don't push me. And so Alpha, this next slide, Alpha is a series of eight evenings of dinner and conversation for people who are not too sure what they think about Jesus. They're open to spiritual things, but don't want to be pushed or pressured. We only let people like that on Alpha because we want them to feel safe. The only Christians on Alpha are people like me who actually love people exploring without any agenda. I do some short talks about exploring Jesus. The groups are in life stages, so you feel you connect with people in your group. And that's a time for, to listen to each other's journeys of faith and where you're at in your faith. I do a live Q&A every week. Ask anything. And my own journey through that. And I promise there's no judgment, no pressure, no preaching. It's just simply dinner conversations and exploring the big questions of life together. What I find is, on the next slide, this is actually how Alpha's really helpful. Because this is my journey. I actually needed quite a few Alphas, not just one actually, to go on this meandering journey. And actually I discovered Jesus because someone loved me by giving me that safe space. Who in your life then can you bring to Alpha? Maybe you're here tonight going, actually, I think that's for me. I've been invited to church today. I'm not too sure what I think, but I'd love a place to explore on my own terms. We do something, next slide, we do something called the Alpha Launch Night, which is a one-off evening before Alpha begins where you can bring a friend and they can just see for themselves if they want to do it. I host that evening, I tell people my own story, I tell people a bit what Alpha is and we have a great dinner, we have a great, lots of fun. We have normally about four to 500 people who come and then some people come back next week to do Alpha, some don't, that's okay. We just want people to decide for themselves. Do you wanna have these fun dinner conversations for eight weeks? 
But the key thing is, you've got someone in your life who I think you should bring to that launch night. Because God has put you around people to love them. And your microevangelism is simply going, hey, do you want to come with me to this launch night? My friend Gare loves to help people explore Jesus, explore faith in a safe environment. He's kind of doing a kind of a show and tell one evening what it's about, and you can make up your mind if you want to come. We have great food, a DJ, a pub. We'll have a great time. But here's the thing. Who can you invite? Lots of you going, but is it going to be cheesy? Is it going to be weird? Will I lose a friend if I bring them? So... Here's a little film to show you very briefly the vibe of that launch night, that you go, oh, that looks fun. I can come to that. Let's watch this. The most fun part of Alpha was the launch night. Oh my gosh, it was so much fun. There, it was, there was a DJ, there were churros, there was great conversation. It was, it was a blast. So the energy that was radiating out of this place, how was I was like, oh my gosh, there's a whole line. It was awesome. Honestly, I think it was just super fun. A lot of laughter and just meeting a bunch of friends and community. Uh, I heard from so many people, they couldn't believe how many people were here. And frankly, that there were this many people questioning and wanting to explore Christianity in Los Angeles. On your seats, you see this little card. I'd love you to get it out um, or pick it up from where you threw it. Because this is actually a bit of microevangelism step three, which is pray. And that's a big deal. And I want you to think of three people in your life who you love. And you can put their names here. Boom, boom, boom. And you can pray and ask God for an authentic, not manipulated opportunity just to go, hey, do you want to come with me to the Alpha launch night? And see what God does. Because God's already having a conversation with them. And maybe you're the kind of hook. Why don't you come and explore? Tuesday, September 24th, the Alpha launch night. Why don't we stand together?